Great. So I'm delighted to be invited to come to speak to Peabody again. I've been here a couple of times and love the barn, love the whole thing. It's just lovely. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, you know, all you people showed up now, filled the chairs, really appreciate that. How many of you thought that you were going to be hearing about a woman carrying a pitcher of water onto the battlefield? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of when you look up mall pitcher, that tends to be what you see. Um, and perhaps many of you have never heard of Mall Pitcher. Huh? Tell me how many before you heard about this uh, lecture today. How many of you had ever heard of Mall Pitcher from Lynn? No. So a handful, yeah. but probably only about 10 or 15 percent of you. Yeah. And yet, in her time, she was known around the world. Anywhere that sailors went to any port in the world, they brought word of Mall Pitcher and her famous clairvoyance and her predictions. First, let's define clairvoyance. It comes from the French clair, uh, or clear, and voyance, or vision. So it's clear vision, and it's described as being able to gain information from some other way other than the normal senses. Um, might be considered possibly a, a, a Sixth sense, possibly. Over the years, there have been quite a lot of people who have exhibited this. There have been, there's been much controversy about is it real, is it fake? Um, by all accounts, you know, from that time period, she did exhibit uh, real clairvoyance. Uh, and even today, although we might say, oh, it's, it's nothing to it, and yet criminologists will sometimes go to clairvoyance uh, and get help from them in solving criminal cases. So it seems to us, like, it seems to me like we're, uh, as a population, we're kind of on the fence. Maybe some people, as my husband says, I want to believe. <laughs> uh, and yet, you know, sometimes we are faced with something where we say, well, we really don't see any other explanation for it. Various forms of mysticism um, have flowed for generations. And I bring up two uh, examples that are contemporary to Maul's time period. And the first is, on the left, is a, a picture of uh, Napoleon and Josephine. And they are consulting a woman named Madame Le Normand. My French is not all that good. <laughs> Uh, and they consulted her on a regular basis uh, for her um, predictions about their future. And a uh, man who went there at the time, his name was a Captain Gronau, he provided a first person, uh, related a first person example of him going to see this woman as well. And he said, she informed me that I should be twice married and have several children and foretold many other events that have also come to pass, although I did not believe one word of the Sybil's prediction. And Sybil is another word for clairvoyant or a foreseer. Emmanuel Swedeberg, pictured on the right here, he, uh, of Sweden, he was reported to have had several clairvoyant experiences uh, dating from childhood, including one in which he stood up in the middle of a dinner party hundreds of miles away from his home and announced that a terrible fire was raging through his hometown and that his home was in danger. He said it threatened the home and yet shortly thereafter he stood up and said, my home is safe. Now, he's hundreds of miles away. We are two to three centuries ago. There is no kind of cell phone communication <laughs> saying, hey, how's my house doing? Um, and yet, it was proven that afterwards that indeed those things did come to pass. So, with that as a background, and I just want to um, talk even about uh, just spiritualism in general. You know, when we look back at the time of the, um, of the witch trials, and today's population, we think, how could that happen? And yet, people of that time lived every day, every hour, every minute of their lives with the complete belief that there was other things at work that you could not see. So we're talking 
you know, way back even before Mall's time. And yet, and I also have an example, and you can come up afterwards and take a look. I have several of these. These are spiritualism. It's called the uh, the progressive thinker. Um, and these are spiritualism newspapers that were published, and I have several of them, and do not ask me how I got them. I, they were passed down, and I suspect that perhaps my great-grandmother um, was into this, because they, they, I didn't buy them. They came in family papers. Uh, and this is from 1915. So they've, it's been around for a long time. <coughs> Ma Pitcher's story starts here, in this house on Orange Street in Marblehead. And it still stands today, you can actually still find it. She was born Mary Diamond in about 1738, and that's Diamond, D-I-M-O-N-D. The house was known as the Old Brig, uh, probably because it was built from timbers from a, a, a wreck along the shore, and it, it had belonged to her grandfather, uh, who was spiritualist of, of some sort in his own right. He was actually known as the Old Wizard or Old Diamond. Various accounts of the time having him uh, have his name as Edward, Aholiab, or John, but as I kind of tried to sift through the research, I eventually decided that it was most likely Aholiab and that John and Edward were four bear bears of, of the Wizard Diamond. In one account, it's mentioned that he was a Wampanoag Indian, and, and that's an important thing when we get to it later in the presentation, and we'll see why. But at any rate, he was well known in his time for the word wonders he performed, which were witnessed by dozens of people, his fellow townsmen in Marblehead. On stormy nights, when ships would be in grave danger of running off, uh, running aground off the shores of Marblehead and Salem, and we all know how many ledges and small islands and how many wrecks there are along there. So these ships would be in grave danger in a storm, and Old Diamond would go up to the top of the old burying ground, up in Marblehead, way up on the hill, and there he would beat about the tombstones, and he would shout out commands like, Captain Smith of the Elizabeth Ann, do you hear me? Keep to starboard four degrees, run true to halfway rock. He would shout these commands in the midst of this storm like a crazy man for hours up in the cemetery, attempting to prevent the vessels from going aground and breaking up on the jagged rocks. Now, common sense tells you that his voice could never be heard that far away especially on a stormy night with wind and waves crashing. But over and over again, captains and sailors alike reported they could hear his voice and his cries when they were far beyond earshot. And that by following his nautical instructions, they avoided shipwreck. He was also consulted in the matter of finding lost items and solving cases of thievery and such. In one instance, it was said that he discovered the thief of an old widow's wood uh, from her woodpile and caused a stick of that wood to be stuck upon the thief's back. And that the thief went back and forth through Marblehead for a day or two with it stuck and he couldn't remove it. And everybody then knew who the thief was. <laughs> it's likely that if he had been born just a few years earlier, he would have undoubtedly shared the fate of those accused in the Salem Witch Trials. Mm -hmm. And so, with such an illustrious grandfather, Mama was well positioned for her future role as a world-renowned clairvoyant. Sometime after her birth, her mother's father gave the family some land in Lynn, and her father built a house on that, and at that time, Indeed, in all throughout Maul's life, the location was lonely and remote. It was situated at the foot of what was known then and is still known today as High Rock in Lynn. As a young girl, Maul is said to have exhibited unusual abilities. She could repeat conversations that her mother had with people, although she was nowhere around. <coughs> Uh, she sometimes appeared to read the thoughts of her family and friends, which did not necessarily make her all that popular. <laughs> she predicted war with um, England 
which people at the time scoffed at. It was well before the revolution. Um, and she uh, predicted an, 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 a, a colonial victory, which her Tory neighbors scoffed at. In 1760, she married Robert Pitcher, who was perhaps an apprentice to her father. Um, and her father seems to have been a, a court waiter or a shoe, a, uh -huh. shoemaker. They lived with her brother and with her parents and her two brothers. And it may have been that Robert was perhaps not all that skillful or skilled, and at any rate, perhaps he just could not support the family. And so it seems that at that, and support the growing family, which by the way, eventually became four children, uh, three daughters and a son. So for whatever reason, she began to ply her trade. She used a combination of methods. Sometimes she just simply sat and talked with her visitor. And she said she could see things um, over them, sometimes visions. And she said she could not make them appear, but sometimes she simply saw visions. Young and old alike con uh, consulted her on matters of lost items, potential love matches, future prospects, the outcome of voyages, which was a very important one. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Her clients really included both the rich and the poor. Um, you know, rich people uh, as well, more educated people also came to her. Uh, it's even said that noblemen uh, from Europe and other places would come and come to find her and ask uh, about their fortunes. The reading of tea leaves, which was the other thing that she employed, consisted of pouring out a cup of tea and then while emptying the cup of its liquid so that only the tea leaves remained. And it was said that the way that the tea leaves formed in the bottom of the cup could be read as a sign. Exam for example, scattered grounds meant unfortunate in love. If the grounds were crowded together, it meant a person would be happy and wealthy. A long line of cup, a, a series of lines of the tea leaves meant a uh, long life, many children, and prosperity. And if no or few grounds remained when you were done pouring out, that was not good. It meant an early demise. <laughs> Her predictions were so often correct, apparently, that news of her skills traveled. And she began to have more and more visitors seeking her out in her small cottage at the bottom of High Rock. Not every client wanted to admit, though, where, where they were going. Perhaps they were a little embarrassed. So uh, there was a doctor who was located across the, um, the path from where her home was. And the doctor had, uh, had big whale jaw bones that were used as a gate. And so sometimes people would just simply ask, well, where is the whale bone gate? Mm -hmm. And by that, they would come to find her. One of her frequent clients was Lord <coughs> Timothy Dexter, uh, the successful and eccentric uh, entrepreneur of Newburyport. He was well known for both his business acumen, he purchased things when uh, they were becoming uh, uh, difficult to come by and then sold them at enormous profits, uh, and he was also known for his eccentric behavior. He took to calling himself Lord and was so obsessed, obsessed with the desire to ensure that his funeral met his standards that he actually faked his death <laughs> and then went to his own funeral peering through to see who came and what they said. <laughs> and, and not only that, then he, came, then he, he was unhappy with his wife's demeanor. She was apparently not sad enough. And therefore, he came out into the open in front of the astonished guests and began chastising her for this. <laughs> so yes, he was a little eccentric. <laughs> Uh, but he consulted Ma uh, before his major ventures to decide whether he would go forward or not, and apparently her advice must have been pretty good because he was very successful from a business perspective. It was rumored that Ma was consulted by persons on both sides of the Revolutionary War and that she may have passed secrets to the rebels. She met George Washington 
and um, actually uh, Mrs. Washington as well, but she met George Washington, and she said that above Washington she saw an eagle. The eagle was not chosen as our uh, country's symbol until long afterwards. She also, she also prophesied, prophesied that Mr. and Mrs. Washington would be remembered as the king and queen of America long after their deaths. Recollections from people either who knew Maul or knew people who had known her brought forth not only stories of instances where she had made accurate predictions for individuals seeking advice, but instances where she made predictions of a larger nature, possibly things that at that time people never even saw come to pass. Keeping in mind, you know, and keep an, keep an open mind, but also keep a, you know, a mind that says, you know, things are possible or sometimes things can be simply read in a certain way. Um, here are a few of her visions. Magnificent music will be conducted on wires hundreds of miles away and will play at the instigation of man. The radio. People will keep horses for pleasure, which was something that was unknown at that time. People didn't do that. Thousands shall go behind a curl of smoke. <laughs> Carriages will go at lightning speed, and none shall see what propelled them. <laughs> Men will ascend and descend Jacob's ladder of heaven like angels. People will be transformed in small numbers through the air by the pressure of a foot. They will be suspended between two threads. I have seen them travel mostly in ones or twos or fours, in something like a basket. The elevator. Now here's one. Men shall arise who will command the storms, turning and directing them at pleasure. Great heat will be prevented by the use of clouds, which can be turned on or off at will, and water shall be pumped from them where drought is upon the earth. Frozen water in winter shall be thawed by glorious sunbeams led by sun conductors and several other wonderful inventions. So, I know of no invention like this yet. However, I would have to say that with the way technology is going, or global warming, one of the two, yeah. um, <laughs> we, may have, we may see that yet. After her parents and brother died, Maul inherited the cottage. She never became rich, but she undoubtedly helped her family um, out substantially. Uh, her son married, but he never did really very well. He squandered a lot of money, and she ended up supporting him as well until his early death. She never used her powers for ill, as far as any of her, the contemporaries said. She was impatient with people who asked questions such as, um, you know, where is buried treasure? And she said, she would say, well, fools, if I knew that, I would go and find it myself. <laughs> <laughs> she helped her neighbors where she could, such as getting up early to travel to um, a grist mill to get some, uh, some meal for a poor old woman who lived close by. Uh, it's also said that she may have assisted the rebels um, by hiding supplies somewhere around a pond in Lynn. Now, let's leave Maul for a minute and return to High Rock, which itself has been tied to significant people and events, including one of a mystical nature. High Rock is 200 feet uh, high, and it's an outcropping of crystal-filled granite. And it may have had uh, mystical meanings uh, for the tribes that were living there before the um, Europeans arrived. <coughs> In the 1850s, John Murray Spear, a former Unitarian minister, became involved in spiritualism and claimed that he was receiving spirit messages from persons such as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and his own father and namesake, John Murray. Spear would go into, uh, and by the way, John Murray is the, uh, was the founder of, uni of universal, Unitarian, Unitarian Universalism. Uh, Spear would go into trances 
and deliver messages from persons beyond. We said we're working uh, in the afterlife to promote the betterment of mankind here still on earth. Or in this world, I think I really should say. Pictured here is an, a published account of the spiritual messages that Spear claimed to have received from his father. The title says it is an important instruction to the inhabitants of the earth. Following instructions from this, from that he received on High Rock, from this group of spirits, which Spear called the Band of Electrolyze, Electricizers, he built a machine that was to receive and translate these messages and got permission from the Hutchinson family who owned uh, High Rock at the time. They were a family, uh, they were a family of famous singers uh, um, of that time. He got permission from them uh, to place this machine on High Rock because he was instructed that it was the best place to receive these spiritual messages. At the moment when it was supposed to begin working, a peg pregnant woman is said to have touched it, and at the time it began to vibrate. If nothing else, it was an early electrical experiment, and it's interesting to think that years later, Lynn became the home of General Electric. <laughs> I mentioned the Hutchinson family, uh, and they lived at High Rock. Uh, they were a well-known family of singers. Uh, they were very heavily involved in causes, especially abolition, and they sang a lot of abolition songs. Uh, and when John Hutchinson was very old, he gave the property to the city of Lynn to be preserved. And the, the tower, which had been destroyed during um, celebrations at the end of, of the Civil War, was rebuilt. Um, and High Rock is still a park uh, today. I don't know if any of you have ever been to it. Uh, it's an interesting place. I went there you know, uh, to see it, and it's a very interesting place. I hope, that, I hope they maintain it and keep it up. Maul, again, this person that you've you know, barely ever heard of, was a significant enough figure to have been mentioned in literary works including The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne, and in Henry David Thoreau's journal, he wrote about her as well. Perhaps the most famous piece of literature about her was penned by John Greenleaf Whittier. It was his, only his second published work when he was a young man. Although he was a child when she died, and could not possibly have remembered her personally, he wrote a 900-line poem describing her in a very uncomplimentary nature. <laughs> I'm not going to read all 900, 900 lines, but this is, what, this is how he described her. She stood upon a bare, tall crag which overlooked her rugged cot, a wasted, gray, and meager hag, in featured eagle as her lot. She had the crooked nose of a witch and a crooked back and chin, and in her gait she had a hitch, and in her hand she carried a switch to aid her work of sin. Whittier grew to dislike the poem in later years. Essex historian Alonzo Lewis, who actually did know her, um, described her in one way, uh, but actually in the Essex Antiquarian, uh, Sidney Purley wrote something about her in 1899. So information about her continued on and on and on. People were writing about her long after. Alonzo Lewis uh, described her thus, and he had known her, did remember her. Her head was somewhat capacious, her forehead broad and full, her hair dark brown, her nose inclining to be long, and her face pale and thin. Her countenance was intellectual, and she had the contour of face and expression which, without actual beauty, was thoughtful, pensive, and somewhat interesting. She had an eye when she looked at you of calm and keen penetration, an expression of intelligent discernment. A play was written about her by playwright J.S. Jones, 
and performed at the uh, National Theater in Boston. Ellen Hoey, decades after her death, wrote a book about her based upon her research of Mall's predictions. Articles continued to be written about her decades and decades after her death, as this one in the New York Times. And both Lynn and Marblehead have laid claim to her as an important historical figure in their respective histories. This is a postcard of her home in Lynn. I have, um, I have this actually, you can see these, this postcard was published as well as this one. This, um, this, nobody obviously, she died in 1813. Nobody really knows what she looked like, but this um, image was penned of her and kind of became the sort of de facto of what she looked like from um, descriptions of her looks of the time. And a lot of things, such as those postcards and other items as well, were put out as commemorative. I mean, she was, you know, people wanted to, to um, capitalize on her, her fame. And as a matter of fact, the spoon that uh, you see referenced there, I actually have one of. And there's a little picture you can see, kind of, it's a little hard to see, but at the top of it, there's a little picture of her, and it says, Mall Pitcher, Lynn. In this little spoon. And that it brings us to the more recent past. As I relay a story not too far back in time uh, that's closely tied to the subject. So this, um, this gentleman is Robert Cahill, a uh, late author, um, and he wrote this book, Witches and Wizards. Uh, and he was a former Essex County sh uh, Sheriff. He passed away a few years ago. So he wrote um, about uh, an encounter that he personally had uh, with, if not Mall Pitcher, um, something closely related to her. And I'm going to read a little bit of you so you can see what, what happened, you know, uh, how this continues, or perhaps Mall's influence continues. Today in Lynn, Massachusetts, there is a fortune teller who claims to be Molly Pitcher's great-great-great-granddaughter. Upon returning to Massachusetts in 1960, after two years with the Army in Africa, I went to visit this woman. She was a pleasant white-haired lady who invited me into her sitting room. But as I approached the doorway, she asked me to stop. She cocked her head as if listening to somebody speak, although I heard nothing, and there was no other person around. Who is Francis? she asked me. I thought for a moment and answered, my father. His name was James Francis Cahill, but only his older friends and relatives called him Francis. He's very ill, said the old woman, and he should see a doctor. I felt a cold chill creep up my spine. The old woman was right. My father had not been feeling well, and at times could hardly catch his breath. Even at my mother's constant pleadings, however, he would not see a doctor. He called them all quacks. He didn't see a doctor until it was too late. He died of cancer a few years later. There was no way at the time that this fortune teller could have known who I was, what my father's name was, or in what condition he was. It was my first fortune telling experience and I was impressed. She then went on to tell me that I worked closely with a member of my family and that my work had something to do with the sea. She was right again. I worked for my brother who was president of New England Divers, an underwater salvage and sales business. She continued to act as though she was talking to some unseen spirit in the room after questioning the spirit with, what's that? Or, say that again? I sat silently in awe. You just returned from a long trip to somewhere far away. 
That's true, I replied. You did not like what you saw there. It disturbed you. Yes, I admitted. I was upset at the disease and poverty I witnessed in Africa. Someone named Joe will have a great significance on an influence on your life, she said. But this prediction, as yet, has not come to pass. I think it is rather ironic, though. For when I was a little boy, there was a fellow named Joe constantly at my side. I have no idea where he came from, but he was with me for years to the point that my parents were worried. Nobody could see Joe but me. Maul died in 1813 and is buried in the West Burying Ground in Lynn. Her grave went unmarked for more than 60 years until a group of citizens in uh, 1887 uh, collected together and raised the money to put in a stone. Um, and it ironically had, is inscripted on the back with this from, uh, from Whittier's poem. Even she, our own weird python, our own weird hero, heroine, sole pythoness of ancient Lynn, sleeps calmly where the living laid her, and the wide realm of sorcery, left by its latest mistress free, hath found no gray and skilled invader. So, you might ask, how did I, most of you have never heard of her, how did I become interested in kind of somebody who's passed into obscurity even though she's in our own neighborhood, only a couple of towns away, and has been gone for over 200 years. Well, I think that this will explain it. <laughs> she's my fifth great-grandmother. <laughs> she's my fifth great-grandmother. Uh, yeah, so beware. <laughs> My mother's mother used to think that I exhibited signs of this, um, but I think I was just true, not, not clairvoyant. So one final note, there is a bit more to this story. Pictured here, is my, uh, above, is my home in Topsfield. My husband and I bought this house in 1996. The house had been for sale the previous year, but, uh, and we had admired it, but couldn't buy it at the time. And so we had assumed that it had already been sold when we started to look for a house a year later. And we told the realtor, we said, we'd really like a house like that one. So what can you find for us? Um, and then she said, you know, it actually never sold. And they took it off the market. Um, and a month later, it went back on the market, and she called us immediately. Uh, we went in. We, we, we couldn't even get in the door, but and we were both traveling that day. Uh, so we looked in the windows, and we told the realtor, we'll probably take it. <laughs> <laughs> because we wanted it too, so much, and we bought it full price. Now, keep in mind, at the time, um, I knew nothing about Mall Pitcher, except that family lore said that we were in some way related to her. My mother would say, oh, we're related to Mall Pitcher, and she could empty a ship, and that's about all I knew about it. Um, and research was a lot harder back then, so you know, it wasn't as easy to, to discover this. So I said, oh, that's nice, Mom. <laughs> um, well, it turns out that this house was modeled after the Hutchinson's house at High Rock, and is itself called High Rock Cottage. Coincidence? 